RNA. Welcome to Sunday Morning Forum at the First Unitarian Society in Milwaukee. Before we begin this morning, I'd like to remind you that next Sunday, December 4th, our speakers will be Vashti Mosier and Melissa Meyer. They're with the Chicago, Chicago. They're with the Shorewood Connects program. Their title is Dementia Friendly Individuals and Communities. And a quick reminder that we are in an optional mass period here at programs. And while also honoring the COVID safety needs of those present, you do have the choice of whether to wear a mask or not. Quick question by raise of hand. Um, would anyone like to have coffee available here? Sure. <laughs> okay. Okay, and now I welcome our host, our <laughs> who will introduce today's speaker. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Tom Lickey, um, former art instructor and artist who has worked uh, in the United States and Australia. Um, spent three decades leading museums and uh, chronicling Wisconsin's rich art history. Uh, Lickey's crowning achievement was uh, transforming the West Bend Art Museum into the Museum of Wisconsin Art, which opens its uh, new state-of-the-art building in 2013. Um, if you haven't been there, it's a great place. Uh, I think yearly membership is $25 for a couple. Um, he has taught graduate courses in Wisconsin art history, and his essays have been published internationally. So I'd like to uh, present then um, Don Lickey, who will talk about a creative place, um, the history of Wisconsin art. Thank you, Mark. Any words? And good morning, everyone. Um, I struggled with deciding how to make this presentation today because what we were trying to do is take 40 years of study, five and a half years of book production. It took four writers, four researchers, over 12,000 hours to produce a book of 46 pages, 480 images. And as I said, covers 13,000 years. How does one condense that into a short presentation of, of this length? Um, I thought that a quick overview of the whole book just wouldn't suffice. So I, what I decided to do was take the first few chapters of this seven chapter book and begin working through that. And at the end of our time frame, that's it. We're, we're gonna be cutting off. Um, and then, of course, if you want that information, books are available for sale. So uh, that's that's the game plan for today. And I believe, uh, Mark, are you going to be timing me? Uh, do we have about uh, how many minutes uh, that we can go here? Well, I, um, at about 10.45 would be a good time to uh, okay. open it up for questions. About a half an hour, I'll try to uh, remember that. Well, one, one thing about um, American art history is that uh, for, for decades, uh, maybe up until just the 1970s, that the study and presentation of American art history uh, was not very inclusive. Uh, the book that I learned from, uh, my first art history book, uh, was through, two inches thick, thicker than this, and it didn't mention one woman artist, not one. And nor did it say anything about the uh, pre-white settlement art of the United States. And uh, how many here have heard of Cahokia? Anybody? All right, so we have some people who know about Cahokia. Probably some of you know about Aztalan, uh, which is in Jefferson County, I believe. Uh, this is a city of, um, 600 people at its peak 
Uh, it had a fortification around the wall around it. It had step pyramids. Uh, it was a pretty advanced civilization that came out of central United States. Um, their main capital, if you will, was Cahokia, which is East St. Louis now. And that was a city of 25,000 people at its peak around 1000 AD. So uh, we had a, a vibrant Native American culture creating art in, in the United States. So the question is, if in art history we study about the ancient art of Europe, uh, Africa, uh, the Orient, why would we in our own country not study our own Native American art? So this is why our book uh, began with uh, the chapter called Native Presence, the Beginning of Art in Wisconsin. It was written by archaeologist Robert Bozart, who was the author of Hidden Thunder, uh, Rock Art of the Upper Midwest, and uh, art historian Melanie Herzog, a Madison uh, professor emeritus of Edgewood College. That chapter begins with the Paleo-Indian period of uh, 11,000 uh, uh, BC to 8,000 BC. Then it goes to the Archaic period of 8,000 um, BC to uh, 5,000 or 500 BC and includes the copper culture in Wisconsin, which was significant. And then the Woodland period from 500 BC to 1150 CE. Uh, and that's where the Mississippian uh, tribes uh, come in. That's when they migrated north and spread throughout um, the, the Midwest. And then the Oneota culture uh, from uh, 1100 uh, to about European contact, which in Wisconsin was about 1630, 1634 actually. Uh, the media that's covered in the book is uh, a lot of works in clay, some works in stone, a very interesting stone sculpture that um, was unearthed in a, in a cave in the southwest part of the state, which still remains unknown by uh, um, almost all of, uh, of uh, culture or white culture, I should say. It's a sacred site for the Native Americans and they have the possession of this stone sculpture, but we were able to get it for photograph, well, not get it, but get a photograph of it so uh, there is some sensitivity, cultural sensitivities that we have to uh, be aware of when we are working with these types of things. Uh, cave paintings, which are called pictographs, are in Wisconsin caves. Uh, there's uh, none that are available to be seen, um, but uh, there are there, there is one um, place in Wisconsin where you can see uh, petroglyphs and pictographs uh, that's in the central part of Wisconsin. And if you Google uh, the Department of, uh, I'm not sure which department it is, but if you Google cave painting Wisconsin, you will eventually see this. Then uh, shells, marine shells were used for making artwork, uh, jewelry in particular, and copper was also being used for making jewelry and tools. So, the uh, imagery of this artwork by Native Americans, uh, believe it or not, was somewhat abstract uh, and symbolist. And um, this showed up in the banner stones that they made uh, out of beautiful shaped stones and uh, textured stones. And uh, the other work that they produced was not unlike uh, Euro-American work. It was figurative realism. Um, and that too was done in limestone um, and uh, much, much of that still exists and is in collections at Beloit College, State Historical Society, um, and uh, in, in uh, the Milwaukee County Historical Society, uh, pardon me, the Milwaukee Public Museum. The second chapter was Encounters in Art Settlement in Wisconsin. It co covers the time frame of 1634 to 1870. And um, during this uh, time period, uh, artists worked in many, many different uh, media. Um, the earliest part of this time frame uh, th that artwork showed up in was on the French maps, the French maps of uh, one in particular of 1688, 
shows marginal drawings on the side column. We don't know who the artist was, but obviously somebody was here uh, around the 1600, late 1600s, and did sketches uh, as part of an exploratory expedition that uh, went from Green Bay um, through the Fox River and then the Wisconsin River down to La Crosse and then down the Mississippi River. So there was this uh, waterway that connected the East Coast uh, Atlantic Ocean to the uh, Gulf of uh, the Mississippi River. And that, that transportation network and that network between explorers and uh, the artists who sketched along that way and then indeed the Native American trade route ran right through Wisconsin. Wisconsin was a very critical uh, point in that juncture of connecting cultures and materials that went back and forth. So obviously when the uh, French showed up here, uh, they followed that same system. Uh, Mississippi and its tributaries uh, in, in America became America's super highway for the uh, early Native Americans as well as the early uh, Euro-Americans that uh, came to explore and then some um, settled here. Well, the French were here, as I mentioned, in 1684. Then the Brits showed up uh, and took possession of this territory in 1763. And then in uh, 1783, uh, the United States, uh, the, this area was ceded to the United States and the United States government built Fort Shelby in um, in uh, Prairie du Chien. But the Brits captured that, uh, and within a year, uh, they burned it to the ground because they were retreating. The American troops were coming in. And uh, in 1815, uh, ground, ground was broken for uh, Fort Crawford, and uh, that stabilized the American control over um, the, this part of, of uh, the United States, part of Wisconsin. Um, this was important and significant because once that was stabilized in Prairie du Chien, people began to come and settle. And one of the uh, groups that were here, obviously the largest group, were the military people that settled in the Prairie du Chien area. And um, interestingly enough, there's a lot of really, really significant American history that occurred there. Uh, the commander of the uh, fort uh, was Zachary Taylor, who later became president of the United States. One of his lieutenants was Jefferson Davis, who became the president of the Confederate States. And then Seth Eastman, who was the artist who was uh, doing all of the sketches and the uh, drawings that uh, later showed up in uh, museums uh, there. Uh, in many important museums, including the Smithsonian Art Museum, was uh, Seth Eastman. He was a second lieutenant. And Seth Eastman became one of America's most important artists of that time frame and era. If you've uh, been to the Milwaukee Art Museum frequently and saw uh, the large Seth Eastman painting of an old broken down stagecoach and kids uh, playing on the stagecoach, um, that's, that's his, his most famous painting. Well, he was followed by an itinerant artist who traveled throughout the United States to paint as many of the Native American cultures as he could capture. His name was George Catlin. Now he is probably one of the, well, he is the preeminent uh, early artist of that, of that era. And he painted the indigenous uh, people of, of uh, that region. And in particular, one of the paintings uh, that is included in the book is called um, Women Playing Ball. And Prairie du Chien was a central meeting point for uh, Native Americans from about 500 miles around. And annually, they would come for the buffalo hunt in the plains that began there and went out towards Minnesota. And all of these tribes uh, would, would meet. And it was like a conference. It was a social gathering. It was not only for the hunting for food, but it was to exchange materials, ideas for young people to meet, uh, to, to, to get together and, and marry, or um, uh, even activities like playing ball. And that's, of course, uh, 
it would be like the Super Bowl uh, in, in lacrosse uh, playing lacrosse. So from lacrosse up to uh, Parade Machine, the game was played with as many, when the women would play, as many as a couple of thousand playing at one time. If you can imagine everybody just, it was a drop in. You just, if you wanted to play, you just came. Well, this is illustrated in the painting by George Catlin in the book. And that painting is at the Smithsonian Art Museum in Washington. Catlin was followed by his Canadian counterpart, John Kane, who also traveled the Wisconsin waterways to capture the essence of Native culture here. One of his stops in 1849 was at Lake Butamore, which is near Lake Michigan. He painted a nighttime lake scene of Native fishermen spearing fish from their canoe, which was illuminated by torchlight, um, which was at the bow of the boat. And uh, the fish were attracted to the light so they could spear the fish as they came in. Uh, today, uh, Kane is considered one of Canada's most important uh, painters. And this painting uh, from Wisconsin is in the Royal Ontario Museum in uh, Canada. Around the same time, another prolific uh, Canadian painter and chemical di diorama maker, we'll explain chemical diorama in just a minute, um, moved from Canada to Oshkosh to help with uh, the developing trade uh, in, on Lake Winnebago in the 1840s. It was believed that uh, uh, this would be the metropolitan area, that the Fox Valley was around Lake Michigan, uh, Lake uh, Winnebago was going to be the big growth area for Wisconsin. So um, his brother moved from Canada, built a couple of steamboats to ply uh, Lake Winnebago. And uh, he came down to help his, his brother. And uh, that failed. So uh, Mark Robert Harrison then moved to Fond du Lac and uh, began, uh, continued to do his studio paintings that he did in Canada. Um, his paintings were well received locally, nationally, and even in England, uh, because he was originally from England before uh, moving to Canada. At the same time, his chemical dioramas were relatively well known and appreciated by the masses in the 1850s, but today they're totally unknown outside of a handful of International Panorama Council historians. During the 19th century, the word panorama in the art referred to three related artistic formats for public entertainment that attempted to create large scale virtual reality, a precursor to the motion picture industry. Harrison's chemical dioramas and all di chemical dioramas created by any artist uh, need some explaining. And what this was, as I mentioned, was an entertainment industry, but the artists would create a scene, perhaps uh, the size of that window, maybe uh, double the width. And he would, or she, but usually he would paint these on a scrim. Uh, not a side of the canvas, but a, a scrim that you could see through uh, if it was back or illuminated. If it wasn't, you would just see what was painted on the scrim. So imagine uh, a scene, a placid rural landscape, a very pleasant scene. And imagine you see it in a winter setting. And then all of a sudden, it begins to slowly change into spring. And everything is still there, but it's it's starting to bud like spring. And uh, you, you just like we see it. And then it goes through all the seasons, summer, and then autumn, everything just turns to an autumn color. Well, how does that happen? How do you do that? The same image is painted on all of the seasons scripts or the story. It doesn't have to be a landscape, it could be a story that changes. So all of this scrim uh, can canvases, if you will, for lack of a better term, are put one after another. And then on the side of each of these, backlighting each of them is a gas lantern. And the type of gas that they use was a chemical type of material, hence the chemical dioramas. And so when it was time for the season to change, somebody was backstage lighting these up and did, extinguishing the ones in front of it. So you saw this change. Well, 
It's hard for us with all of our technology that we see in the virtual reality to understand the significance of this. But to see that happen would be like seeing somebody walk on the moon like we saw 50 years ago and couldn't believe what we were seeing. Um, so he did this in Wisconsin. I don't know of any other uh, American artist who was doing chemical dioramas. I'm sure there were a few, but uh, there are very few people who knew about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, our information from our book that we received came out of Manhattan from a researcher who's been studying this for three decades. And she shared this information for us about the spine black artist. So you would think that we would have known about that, but there were articles written in the 1850s about where it was shown in Beloit and Watertown and, and all of the success that it had throughout the Midwest. So we were really uh, thrilled to be able to add this information to the uh, course of uh, American art history, at least Wisconsin art history. Another form of panorama entertainment that was uh, called the moving panorama, and it occurred at about the same time. And uh, the most important one for Wisconsinites was the one painted by Englishmen and St. Louis, Missouri artist Henry Lewis. He spent time in Western Wisconsin sketching shoreline in the villages and small towns of the, along the Mississippi River so that they could be included in his 4,000 foot long moving panorama canvas. Now, if you can imagine, uh, he went all the way from uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, up in the St. Paul area, all the way down to New Orleans and back, sketching all the scenes coming and going. And then he went back and he painted these scenes on canvas. And one shoreline was 2,000 feet long, the other shoreline was 2,000 feet long, and these canvases were as high as um, that window, the stained glass window. They were on big telephone or telegraph uh, uh, spools, and they were angled. So the audience uh, sat here, and they saw the canvases. And there was a narrator who would do sound effects and talk and lecture. And so you would, it would unroll, and you'd be feel like you're going down the river. And he would talk about what's coming up next. And as it, the canvas came past you, you would see it go by and then you would look at the next scene. So some of these scenes uh, took place in uh, Western Wisconsin and um, some of them were historic. Some of them didn't occur during the time frame that they were there. They were kind of like revisiting history, recent history, such as the battles at Prairie du Chien and the fighting in Prairie du Chien between the Brits and the Americans. They would stop the, the rolling of the spools at that time and talk about what was happening. And then on goes the music and the sound effects. And then they would continue down the river um, in their virtual reality. So um, that was the second iteration of panoramas in Wisconsin. The third iteration of panoramas in Wisconsin is called uh, cyclogramas. Um, in some ways, they were like the uh, moving panoramas, except they didn't move. They were created in the round. So the big panorama canvases that were painted here in Milwaukee, um, some of them five stories high, 50 feet tall. Those uh, canvases, um, that's my train of thought, <laughs> sorry. Those canvases, uh, that were painted here in Milwaukee uh, were called cyclorama because they were in the round. And uh, what you were able to do is walk in and at your leisure, walk around to see the, the history that was there. So it would be like being, um, in this case, in a couple of cases in, in Milwaukee, these were battle scenes, civil war battle scenes. So it would be uh, like you were standing here and you could walk around and get a 360 degree view of the war that was going on around you, but it was frozen in time. There was no movement, no, uh, no motion. But what, how they were enhanced was with um, set designs in front of them, soldiers uh, three-dimensionally modeled, 
battlefield equipment laid around dirt that was rounded up to the canvas so that when you walked around you saw um, in scale uh, life-size figures and life-size civil war battle equipment and then you would get farther up that goes up to the canvas and everything was foreshortened so that it, it created an illusion of depth and distance um, so and that was the the, the uh, best known uh, format of panorama painting in Wisconsin uh, in, in the United States so Chicago was the lead city in terms of panorama companies there were six Milwaukee had a close second um, we had uh, two major ones and several uh, iterations of um, reorganizing some of those panoramas. Um, I could go on for a long, long time about the panorama painting. As a matter of fact, there have been many books uh, written about it. There's still research going on uh, with some information at the Milwaukee County Historical Society that's been going on for for decades now, for several decades now, I should say. Um, Michael Kutzer uh, is the uh, person who has uh, taken it on to do the interpretation of uh, um, the Heine Diaries, uh, Frederick Wilhelm Heine, and one of the panorama painters who came over with uh, about a dozen other uh, artists from Europe to work in William Werner's panorama studio in Milwaukee. Um, and uh, Heine was one of the lead artists uh, in this, uh, area and he was the only artist, no, panorama artist uh, known in the United States or anywhere for that matter, who chronicled a daily diary uh, throughout this and his full lifetime. So this information written in old German uh, needed to be uh, translated and uh, uh, transcribed and translated. And Michael has been uh, diligently working on that for for many, many years now, but it has provided us keen insight into the life and workings of the panorama painters. And that too is uh, deeply covered in the book. Uh, and the book also includes some great photographs of the only uh, Milwaukee panorama painting that is known to exist today, which was recently restored in Atlanta, Georgia. It's the Battle of Atlanta. Um, so, uh, which is kind of ironic because um, they lost that war. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, it's an important canvas and the photographs show how it's, it's all, uh, created. So um, have a look at that uh, as, at, at a later date if you uh, would mind. Well, um, the earliest settler artists in Wisconsin, though, were, were not the German painters, as many people might think. They were uh, Painters from um, Great Britain, Scotland, um, primarily those, those two regions. And one of them was Samuel Morrison Brooks, who later moved to California and became one of America's most important artists of that time. But he did settle in Milwaukee in 1848 and um, was commissioned by the Wisconsin State Historical Society to paint landscapes of Wisconsin's new uh, infrastructure at the time. Um, so, and also uh, portraits of the important Native Americans at that time. Those paintings then form the core of the earliest art collection in Wisconsin, which was the State Historical Society's collection. And uh, one of their most important paintings was by Brooks of Chief Oshkosh, which I can't wait for 2026 uh, to come around because they're building a brand new museum um, in the Capitol uh, Square area there, and this would be one of the more, more important you know, paintings that will be on display at that time. But just a year later, in 1849, Henry Vienna left Germany and settled with his family in Milwaukee. Shortly thereafter, his children tragically died of disease, and his wife decided to leave him and return to Duke's uh, His devastating loss is uh, vaguely evident in one of his paintings in which he incorporates his self-portrait. Um, his self-portrait is hidden within the dark and gloomy winter sky and um, traversing an inhospitable barren landscape is a small figure worked into it, 
presumably that of the artist uh, himself seeking shelter in this stormy life. Um, he stays in Milwaukee and becomes known as the father of Wisconsin art because so many artists studied with him over the course of his long uh, career, including one very important artist, probably the most important artist from Milwaukee of this era would be Karl Marr, um, who was not a, a German, uh, he was a, a German American or American German um, person who eventually became director of the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Germany, and one of only two Americans ever to become directors of major European art academies. So um, the, for five decades between uh, 1825 and, um, what are we doing on time? Five minutes. <laughs> this is, it's hard. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, so for the five decades between 1825 and 1875, most of Wisconsin artists were immigrant artists who trained at European academies, mainly the British, Scottish, and German, and to a lesser extent, the French in, uh, in, in Italy. However, art was also being taught in the earliest Wisconsin colleges and universities, such as those in Milwaukee, Fox Lake, Don College was there, Beaver Dam, male counterpart of um, Downer College, and then Appleton. But instruction at these institutions was very rudimentary and a much lower level than the major European art academies. In other cases, particularly in Wisconsin, rural area artists uh, were self-taught, such as furniture maker Peter Glass, who uh, comes from the Beechwood area, which is up in the Kettle Moraine, a very, very small, um, village. This man spent his winters uh, making furniture and he uh, created intarsia, pictures with small slivers of different uh, kinds of wood. He created a collage or, or a montage of images on these tables. His most important one is at the, permanently on display at the Smithsonian Institute. It was one he made uh, and give, gave to uh, Mary Todd. Uh, when President Lincoln uh, was uh, assassinated. Another uh, self-taught artist was quilt maker Betsy Seeley Sears, who in 1843 walked from Detroit, Michigan, to Waukesha with her family and an ox drawn cart filled with their meager possessions. Shortly after arriving in December, they lost their three children to disease. Her hardship required sacrifices that almost made her abandon her art, yet she persevered to produce some of the most outstanding quilts um, from Wisconsin quilt makers. Another important and interesting story about quilts in the book is the Peshtigoe Fire, which was the worst fire in American history. <clears throat> well over a thousand people died. And it was quilts that saved the lives of many of these people who escaped the fire. Uh, quilts were taken and drenched in water, and people tried to run through the fire. Uh, and it was such a vicious fire that it consumed uh, the oxygen, and people just dropped over for lack of oxygen. And others perished in the fire and were vaporized into ashes. And yet, those that were close enough to the water drenched their quilts in the water and covered their heads so that the embers didn't burn them and they ran to the river and survived in the river. Unfortunately, a few of them uh, died of hypothermia in the river, uh, but it's just a tragic story, but it is tied to the art of Wisconsin. And quilt making, uh, along with ceramics and watercolor, were women's art of the 19th century. These were their art forms that were uh, preferred by them, and it was a societal uh, form of, of creativity uh, that was um, gender driven. So um, it's, that is all covered in in uh, the, that chapter of the book. In just two minutes, I just want to briefly mention that the Great Cultural Expansion, Chapter Three, covers the time frame of 1870 to 1918, and that that alone could easily take. Uh, a half an hour. There are stories about uh, people like Vinnie Rempoxi, whose family moved to Washington, D.C. when she was 14. Um, 
She went missing when she was a little child, maybe two or three years old in Madison. Uh, they couldn't find her for several days. Uh, they found her happy playing with a little uh, Native American girl in their settlement. Uh, they found her, they didn't know what to do with her. They took her in. Um, and so she, she was one of the earliest settlers of uh, Madison, but uh, as I mentioned, left uh, at the age of 14, which by that time she was creating some art. And there while in Washington, she studied with um, um, well-known American sculptor, Clark Mills, and became his studio assistant. And it, at age 18, she decided she would boldly go up to the White House, knock on the door, and asked to speak to the president and ask if she could do his portrait. And guess what? He answered the door, he agreed to do it, and at 18, she sat down and she created a, a bust, a portrait of, of him. And uh, within, I think it was six weeks after that, he was assassinated. She then lobbied a uh, congressman to do uh, a statue, federal statue of President Lincoln. They agreed to do it. They had a commission. She was selected. She was 18 at the time. She was 19 at the time. She did the uh, statue of President Lincoln in the Capitol in the rotunda. If any of you were there, uh, when you walk in, it's, it's just slightly to the left. There it is. So she was the youngest woman ever to have a commission uh, by the United States Congress to do uh, sculpture. Um, so, and it's a fascinating uh, story. Uh, Lydia Eli is another very important Milwaukee artist. Um, the Milwaukee Exposition Building is tied into that. Uh, the Veterans Center, uh, the Milwaukee Veterans Center near uh, the Brewers Stadium. Uh, that was all as a result of, of her work. Um, she was just an amazing woman. Uh, that we really don't have time to uh, go into unless you ask questions a little bit later. Alexander Marcus, a Scottish painter, painted a, a very important portrait of a Civil War veteran from Wisconsin, John Wales Jefferson, who fought in 41 conflicts, was gone for four years, uh, took charge of the Wisconsin troops from the Madison area, came back and uh, settled uh, and get back in Madison where his father had come to, uh, to, to uh, run a hotel there. And um, it wasn't until the mid 1990s that we discovered who this sitter was. It was the grandson of President Thomas Jefferson and the grandson of his uh, uh, slave wife, if you will, Sally Hemings. Um, and that whole story of how we discovered that and what we discovered and how it changed the thinking of that whole uh, bit of American history, uh, that, that happened in West Bend. That change of, of that thinking uh, was, uh, um, bore a lot of fruit. Uh, we invited the uh, family, the other families uh, that were resettled around the, the Midwest and came to some very interesting conclusions. Uh, that you can't refute. Um, so art and history goes hand in hand. My book was written in that regard so that art was put into context because unless we know the context in which it was created, we have no idea what is important and what isn't important. So with that, um, I leave over half of my talk. Uh, I'm, I'm done and we'll answer any questions if you have. I didn't have a question. Oh, could I set it on this table? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I think that's the page. No, it's the next one. Good. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I'm open to any questions. Yes. Is the story true about Clark Gable maybe coming to the cyclone in Atlanta? <laughs> that's a good question. That would always. Uh, comes no, he wasn't. Uh, the truth of the matter is, for the opening of uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, he showed up down there and was photographed in front of it, and uh, it was it was just a promo thing. But he wasn't 
from that six center. I saw somewhere that his face had been painted in blood for dead soldiers. Uh, so that's just a story. I, I, I don't think so. Um, no, I mean, somebody might have saw somebody who looked a little like that and came to the conclusion. Um, but if, if that does bear any fruit or change, which I don't think it would, Michael Kutzer's uh, translating would, would probably change that because uh, these panoramas were painted in the 1880s. Clark Gable wasn't around then. So somebody would have had to go on in and overpainted a face. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, it's possible. It's possible, but the whole history of panorama painting is still up in the air. Uh, until we started doing the research of the Milwaukee panorama painters, no one knew that these canvases that disappeared showed up in other places. We found outcuts that were cut out of the canvas after they came back and the background repainted so it looked more like a studio painting. And as a matter of fact, Moa has a couple of those. Uh, in the collection, um, we found out that an investor bought them up and started shipping them all over the world to be seen. Uh, one might have ended up in the Bay of Tokyo, where it fell off a boat <laughs> and uh, was never recovered. So that whole story is is always evolving. There is so much to be uh, reviewed about that. Anything else? Yes. Um, recently, a local historian, John Goder, did a um, special PBS awesome. program, um, Fisher Folk of Jones Island, and um, Paul Hammersmith did a lot of sketches down there, and he did mention that in his program, showed some of them. Yeah. And they're the historians. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I have a Paul Hammersmith drawing uh, of Jones Island. Um, it's a beautiful little drawing, and it shows something that I need to spend some time investigating. It shows a bathysphere uh, on the shore in the dock area, but the problem if you Google bathysphere is they weren't invented until uh, 1936 or something like that. So what's going on here? Because Paul Hammersmith uh, did this drawing well before that. Um, so it's always kind of an investigative thing. But back to uh, Jones Island, uh, if you watch that carefully, there was a painting of a woman uh, carrying a bucket, walking along with the sh uh, shanty in the background or the old buildings in the background. That was a painting done by one of the panorama painters, Franz, uh, I forgot his name now. Well, anyway, it was um, one of the panorama painters, and that is uh, at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. So uh, there's a, a fair number of paintings in that collection done by artists of Jones Island. Another one was Robert uh, Neumann, who always took his stu students down there because it's such a charming uh, village to, to be able to. Uh, Franz Warbach was the artist name, by the way. Um, so that, that was probably one of the most commonly painted scenes of Milwaukee during the time frame of about 1870 to about 1910, and things started to disappear on the island. Do we have any other questions? How did the, how did the um, MOA get these, acquire these? That's a, a great question. Um, <clears throat> I went to, I started at MOA uh, in 1982. I retired in 2012, beginning in 2013. Um, and then I became a consultant uh, for the Cedar River Art Museum, who, by the way, is publisher of the book. Um, but in 19, I think it was maybe about 1985 or 88, um, uh, our collector from Milwaukee and Gulf Pro, Bob Brew, came up and said, well, you know, there is no Museum of Wisconsin Art. Maybe you guys should do that. And I thought, brilliant. Yes, why not? Why shouldn't we? So we knew that if we announced what we were going to do, uh, all of a sudden, prices would start going through the ceiling. So we quietly, for a decade, quietly started collecting Wisconsin Art. 
Um, and then as part of the 1996 state successful centennial celebration, we were one of the projects the state selected uh, for that. And that was the launch of the public awareness and the first exhibition of the collection that we had. So from that point forward, we started collecting and they're still collecting uh, today. Um, uh, mostly contemporary at this point. Yes. Does the book uh, address the uh, artwork that has a uh, social consequence, like uh, the um, memorial to a pigeon from Wadlisa State Park, and there's a pigeon. Um, Statue of Mopan, I think that's important. Um, I'm sorry, could you state that again? I'm, I am a, the, uh, I'm asking for a uh, social uh, artwork of social consequence, like the, the one although the old maid had, had made yeah. what was it? Absolutely. You, you will see the narrative in the book leans heavily towards that. Uh, you will see the image selections uh, towards that. Um, inclusion is extremely important because exclusion up until 1980 in American art history was incredible, unbelievable that these academicians would ignore folk art, Native American art, art from women, and people who make social commentary, uh, people who are concerned about the land, uh, all of those issues show up in the book. Yes. Um, two sort of questions. Um, I wondered how else we could find you and learn more. And if you are teaching a class or something. <laughs> and the other thing is, did you have Native people represented on your, on your council that created the history of the book. Uh, yes, uh, Karen Hoffman uh, from Eau Claire. Um, we consulted with her a bit. Um, Melanie Herzog and Madison consulted with uh, some of the Native American people uh, at the university. Um, uh, Anne Marie Sawkins, the co producer of the book, uh, who did the contemporary ch chapters. Uh, leaned heavily on uh, some of the Native American artists that were included. Uh, Robert Bozart uh, did, you know, he's not Native American, but has close connections and contacts with them. Um, some of the things that we got through Beloit College uh, were somewhat indirectly connected with uh, Native American um, advisors. So uh, probably not as much as we should have. Um, Probably not as many women. Uh, well, actually, there was quite a few women people involved in in the book. But I guess my point is that as thick as the book is at six and a half pounds, we could have made it twelve pounds and still not been as inclusive as we could have or should have or wanted to. Oh, that's okay. I'm, right. Thank you for doing that. I, I've got a great memory, but it's not be sure. I, um, for four summers, I taught a graduate course on Wisconsin art history at MOA. Um, and uh, we went up to 1980, and it was, it was a 45-hour course, a whole week, a full day, each day of the week. Um, that's the type of thing I think would be possible. It would be fun to do, but I don't think uh, it's going to happen, unfortunately. Um, my uh, schedule and my personal situation uh, just uh, calls for my attention and time to be focused elsewhere. Um, I. My family gave up an awful lot for five and a half years uh, <laughs> with the hours I, I put in on the book. Um, so I just, I'd love to, but I just don't think I can. Uh, the Cedarburg Art Museum has been talking about the possibility of doing uh, a lecture like this of each of the chapters and then having it available online. So that might be doable. And that way, 
People don't have to get in their cars and go anywhere. They can do it from the comfort of their home uh, and they can do it as long or as deep as they want to. So uh, perhaps someday I or somebody else will, will go ahead and summarize each chapter like I've done here and be a little bit more complete. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's uh, 11 o'clock and I could stay here as long as anybody wants, but I thank you probably. Some people are going to the next one. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. If anybody would like to go on to you can take care of that uh, now, or you can just swing by and see the Cedar Park Museum and pick one up online. And, and we have order. a book area here. Yes. If, if I don't know, sometimes we have books available to buy. But I don't know how you work it out. 